Hello, hello, hello. What's going on, good people? Welcome, welcome, welcome to session three of the Foundations class. Say hello. I see a number of you are saying hello already in the comments. But if you are on the Zoom with me, say hello. If you're on the live stream on the Facebook group, say hello. It's good to see you all tonight. I am excited, excited to jump in to session three. Hello, good to see you. There you go. Good to see you. <clears throat> well, I just want to say hello to all of you guys from all around the world who are joining in tonight. This is session three of the Foundations class. We're going through the foundational doctrines of Christ uh, as outlined in Hebrews 6. I see you guys say hello, hello. Shout out to D3 in, uh, in the comments there. My wife is in the comments. Hello. Uh, and so we are in session three. And so as you can see already tonight, I know it's just a little bit after seven, but the numbers of people in attendance are already getting low compared to who's here uh, every week or who has registered. So this is what I want you to do. Because this is an eight-week course, I know everybody's got lives, everybody's busy and all of that, but we make time for what we want to make time for. So I want to ask all of you that are in class tonight that can, if you are in the Facebook group, to go into the Facebook group tonight, make a post after this class uh, and testify about it or say something to encourage those that are in the group that are registered for the class, or if you know somebody who is registered who is missing, reach out to them and let them know to really tune in, uh, to lock in. We got just a few more sessions uh, left in this course, uh, and we're going to finish strong. I told you guys, I think I say it every session, how the devil is really committed to keeping you from this revelation, to keep you from uh, solid biblical truths. Hello, Pastor Ruth. Good to see you. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we really lock in, that we make a commitment to this, and that we push through to grasp all that God has for us. Amen. So shout out to those of you that are here tonight joining us from all around the world. Grab your Bibles. We're going to jump right in. I'm going to pray in just a minute, and we're going to jump in. So grab your Bibles, and let's turn to Hebrews chapter number six. Hebrews chapter number six. Hello. Good to see you guys. Kanisha. Uh, Tammy, good to see you. Tanisha Dorn, Dr. Gordon, good to see you. Amber, good to see you. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, and I tell you this every week, but get you a paper Bible, grab your Bibles, get you a paper Bible. You want to be able to touch the pages uh, and not be distracted by your phone. So if you're, uh, if you have a paper Bible, grab it and let's turn to Hebrews 6. Father, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, tonight we bless you. We honor you. We thank you that, Lord, you are God, and beside you there is no other. Father, we pray tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that, God, you would get all of the glory, all of the honor, all of the praise. Father, we pray that as we study your word tonight, as we learn about what you have laid out as a foundation for us, that, God, you would be glorified in our lives. We pray that you would brew over your word grew over your truth, that the spirit of God would unlock it to us. God, that you would give us revelation of your word. And Father, we thank you that we will be transformed by it. We thank you tonight that you are the only wise God. And Father, it's to you that we look tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good to see you, Larry. Jessica, good to see you. All right. Y'all got your Bibles. We're jumping straight in tonight. Session three. Last session was uh, repentance from dead works. I hope you guys were really, really blessed by that. Session two, repentance from dead works. Session one was identifying your spiritual location. If you missed any of those, uh, please go back, check your email. The notes are in your email, uh, as well as the link to the replays, which are in the Facebook group, as well as the uh, YouTube link. So you can catch those replays for those of you that don't use Facebook. All right. Also, you guys should have got an email from me about the foundations book. I told you guys that I'm uh, taking this course and putting it into a book. And for all of you that are registered for this class, the book is being made to you, made available to you. Hello, Yola. Good to see you. Alicia, good to see you. The book is being made available to all of you, all nearly 200 of you uh, at cost, just at the cost of printing. So I think it's like uh, $3 to print and maybe like $3 to ship. And so there's an email I sent you uh, that talks about that, how you can purchase that uh, book and get copies of it. All that information is there for you. Okay. All right. Are you in Hebrews chapter number six? Let's go to Hebrews chapter number six. It says this in verse one, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection or maturity not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. We talked about that last week. Repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. That's what we're talking about tonight. 
and of the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands and on a, and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. As we are going through these foundational doctrines of Christ, uh, one of the most important things is for us to grasp and understand that we have this solid foundation, and it's imperative that we really grasp it, that we understand it, that we have revelation of uh, what some, what even some translations of this scripture call the elementary principles of the faith, right? And these elementary principles are imperative because, uh, as we talked about in that first session, these are the things that are necessary for us to grasp before we are able to advance. So there are a number of people in the body of Christ who are uh, 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 advancing in many different ways or have a lot of different activities. So it appears as if they are advancing or maybe in certain areas of their life, there is a lot of activity. But we want to not just be, be people who are active. We want to be people who are progressing in the things of God, who are not just making movement, but that we are moving in the right direction, that we are people who are being built up on a solid foundation and solid in our faith. And so these foundational things uh, are imperative that we build right, all right? So when the scripture says we're going on to perfection, we're going on to maturity, we are committed to the growth process. So this second principle of the doctrine of Christ, and y'all can put it in the comments, faith toward God, faith toward God. Faith toward God, as we saw in the last session, is much more than just believing. It is becoming a born-again follower of Jesus. This following of Jesus, uh, it's an act of faith. Uh, is The act of faith is just one small step in a very long journey. Y'all know we're on a journey with Jesus, right? And so this faith towards God, or that initial believing on the Lord Jesus, that initial faith toward God, was just one small step in this long journey of sanctification or this lifelong process, this walk with Jesus that we have entered into this journey, if you will. So when we come to faith in Jesus as a newborn baby, the believer then desires the sincere milk of the word of God that they may grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's go to 2 Peter. We're going to read a scripture real quick. 2 Peter chapter number three, second Peter chapter number three, and let's look at verse 18. We're going to talk about this concept of growing, of developing uh, in faith. So let's go to second Peter three, and we're actually going to start in verse 15. So second Peter uh, three, 15. Sister Lisa, good to see you. Good to see you. Second Peter three, and let's start at verse 15. And to count that the long suffering, I'm reading from the King James, you may have a different version, it may read differently. And oftentimes, like, I love the King James, personally, King James or New King James. But sometimes when I read it, you may hear me like alter the language, just trying to make it make more sense. All right. And to count that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them, of the, of these things in which you are some in which are sometimes hard to be understood he's saying that there are things that are oftentimes or sometimes hard to understand there are things that have been written to us that are hard to understand which they that are unlearned and unstable wrestle there are people who are unlearned unstable they are immature. They really, really wrestle with these things that are hard to understand, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Verse 17, therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things beforehand, seeing you have been given a warning, seeing you have been brought into this information early, you've been given a heads up, if you will. He says, beware, lest you also being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. This is saying like, there's a reason why there are these foundations. There's a reason why there has to be something solid that is laid. And he, and he essentially peeps us, if you will, to these warnings. He gives heed to us uh, to say, hey, this is what's coming down the pike. Be aware of this stuff so that we don't enter into this error. We want to make sure that we are built on a solid foundation so that we can have steady growth. Verse 18 here, is key. Second Peter 3.18. He says, but grow in grace, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. 
By receiving with meekness the engrafted word of God, the child of God is able to increase in knowledge and in understanding, which automatically increases faith. So we come in by faith. We come into the faith by faith. We come in by faith. And then by faith, we run after him. We long for him. We receive the word of God, the instruction of God, the spirit of God, and our uh, in, our sincere sorry, and in our sincere desire for these things, our going after it allows us to grow in faith and be able to move from faith to faith, all right? In Romans 10, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, Paul declares, faith comes by what? Y'all know the, y'all know the word of God? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the what? The word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's by hearing the word of God, not people's opinions of the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I'm not asking, have you received sound? So when I'm asking you tonight, you know, are you, are you, are you hearing by the word of God? I'm not asking you just, are you receiving sound into your ear? I'm asking, are you hearing? Like y'all have been talking to somebody uh, and, and you know that they're just not hearing, they're not listening, they're not connecting, they're not understanding. It's just like one in one ear, out the other. It's just they're they're receiving sound, but they haven't heard. Are you with me? So the scripture says faith comes by hearing. Faith doesn't come just because you happen to, you know, turn uh, uh, your scripture on the YouTube and just let it play in your house. That's beautiful if you do that. But faith doesn't come by that. Faith doesn't come just because you attended a service and you sat under a, 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 a a sermon. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You have to allow the sound to register in your ear, right? I'm sure y'all have had those moments where you've been talking with somebody like, are you even hearing me? Like, are you listening? Are you, is it connecting? Is it making sense? So it, it, there, when, when there is that like reception of sound, but there's not a hearing, there's not an understanding. It's not catching. There's no understanding. This hearing that we're talking about here in this scripture is a supernatural work. I'm not talking about just your physical senses. I'm talking about a supernatural spiritual ear. Do you have an ear? It's what the scripture says. Let him that hath an ear hear what the spirit of the Lord says to the church. When I first heard the scripture, that, that scripture, you let him that hath an ear hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying to the church, I kind of like pause a little bit. Like, what do you mean him to have the ear here? Like if you got ears, you like, you should be able to hear. We all got ears, right? But just because you have an ear doesn't mean you're hearing. It doesn't mean you are connecting. It doesn't mean that you're understanding. So in all our getting, we want to get an understanding. You can grow and you can develop, you can change, you can accomplish supernatural things just by hearing and be able to grow in your faith. Our ears have uh, have to be positioned to appropriate faith, right? So we have to position our ears to be able to hear well so that we can appropriate faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So in a sense like this, is it's, it's what the scripture says, one of my favorite scriptures says, uh, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be li lifted up ye everlasting doors. Well, what are everlasting doors and gates? The scripture says, that we've been created uh, a living soul. So we have a soul. You are a spirit. You live in a body. You possess a soul. You are a spirit. You live in a body. You possess a soul. That's how God made us. You are a spiritual being. You are a spirit. You live in a physical body and you possess a soul. That soul is eternal. Your soul is eternal. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. It is literally like uh, uh, the thing that, that there is so much battle and warfare over is over the soul, the ability to communicate. The soul is like the communication hub, if you will, between the spirit and the flesh. It is the communication hub, if you will, of translating truth, translating the things of God from the spirit realm so that they can not only be possessed in the soul, but also be communicated or lived out. Your body, your physical body is the thing through which your spirit man expresses itself uh, into this world, into this life. So, so when you are born again, let me back up a little bit. When you are born in sin, shaping in iniquity, in your fallen manner or your fallen way, you are, yes, spirit, soul, and body, but your spirit is not like um, 
asleep, right? The scripture says that when you're in sin, you're dead in sin. You're not just like asleep in sin or unconscious or unaware. Your spirit man was dead. So without the Holy Spirit, without the spirit of God, there is like in the fallen state, it's not like uh, uh, your flesh is in charge, and then your soul is a servant to the flesh, and then your your spirit man becomes a slave. That's not how it works. In the fallen nature, your flesh reigns as king. Your soul is a servant to the flesh. It does what the flesh wants to do. It, it communicates uh, uh, and, and translates from the flesh, but there is a communication error when it gets from the soul to the spirit, because the soul is unable, the spirit is unable to receive receive from the flesh. So there's a communication breakdown. The spirit is dead in sin. But when you are born again, you are put back in right order or put back in right uh, uh, standing. And so what happens then is your spirit becomes king. Your spirit reigns as king. That, that spirit man, spirit woman, who you've been created by God to be as a son or as a daughter, that spirit reigns as king. The soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, then becomes a servant to the spirit. This is what the sanctification process is all about. It's about reacclimating your soul to spiritual principle. It's about bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and every uh, imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing them into captivity to Christ, bringing them into obedience to Christ. It's about retraining your soul to uh, possess spiritual truth and then communicate it to be living out by the flesh or to flesh it out. I don't remember what my last point was, so you'd have to tell me because I, I was talking fast. Essentially, when you're in right standing with God, your soul is there to communicate to the flesh, to the uh, flesh, what is the will of the spirit so that the life of God can be expressed physically out of your body into the world that we live, all right? So when we talk about doors and gates, right, the doors and gates of the soul, what are eternal doors and gates? Your soul has eternal doors and gates. Your soul is eternal, and your soul has eternal doors and gates. You have an eye gate. You have an ear gate. You have the gate of touch. Those are just a few. These are eternal gates. So when you hear the scripture say, lift up your head, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, that the king of glory may come in. Well, who is? This is what the writer says. Y'all know the scripture? If I'm talking fast, y'all help me in the notes. The scripture says, well, who is this king of glory? And then it goes on to tell you, the Lord God mighty in battle. The Lord God mighty in battle. Well, who is this king of glory? The Lord God mighty in battle. He specifically was saying, I want the doors and the gates of, of my soul, and these eternal doors and gates to be lifted up, not so that God can come just in any old context, right? Like just a loving father and all of this. No, I want him to come. He's coming in this certain context. He's coming as Jehovah Gabor, the God who is mighty in battle. This is what Paul said. Paul said, uh, uh, Paul said, I found within myself another law that when I would to do good, evil is always present. He said, there's a battle going on over my soul. The flesh and the spirit are at war with one another. What are they warring over? They are warring over the seat of the soul. They want to reign supreme. He said, there's a battle going on. And so when this battle is raging in your heart and in your mind and over your soul and in your atmosphere, this is when you have to declare, lift up your head, O ye gates, that the king of glory may come in. He said, lift up your head, O ye gates, be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord God, strong and mighty, the Lord God, mighty in battle. It's like Jeremiah said. He made the declaration. He said, the Lord spoke to me, said, this battle is not yours. It is the Lord's. He said in the scripture, tomorrow, by the time the sun be hot, your help shall come. So when this co concept, this whole concept of hearing, having a spiritual ear to hear, we have to be able to pray over our ears that our ears may be conditioned or positioned to hear what it is that God is saying, what is the word of the Lord. And therefore, we have to make sure that we frequently ask God to purge out our ear, to unclutter the soul and to get out everything that could be stopping or blocking or causing us to have with the scripture. I think it references it, reference it as uh, like a callous 
on our ears or an inability to hear because of blockage. I hope this is making sense. I'm going to stop for a second because I see a question. Can you explain the difference between your spirit and your soul? Your spirit is, the scripture says that, the scripture says this way in the creation story. It says that God took the dirt, he, he created man, uh, he created that physical body, right? And then the scripture said that, that uh, the spirit of God blew into him the breath of God. Man became a living fish or a living soul. So there is the spirit which comes from God. That is essentially God. All right. There's the spirit of man. That spirit is not activated or that part of God, that part in us that is from God is not even activated until we are born again. It is dead in sin, right? So when we are born again, we come into that wholeness, if you will, where we come, where our whole being then is come, comes alive, is given power by the Holy Spirit, and then we are given identity, purpose, all of that stuff begins to make sense. I don't want to stay here because I got more to talk about. We're talking about faith towards God, but I just wanted to, to drop this in this concept of faith comes by hearing hearing from the word of God. Is that making sense? I hope y'all with me so far tonight. All right. Shout out to y'all in the comments. I appreciate y'all. All right. So faith is important. It is key. Not only is it entry level, but there are levels to faith. There are versions of faith. There are different sides and aspects of faith. One of the things I love about my journey with Jesus is that there is so much to be discovered. God takes joy in revealing things to us. Y'all got to understand, right, that the God, the creator of the universe, Jesus, he knows a, a whole lot. <laughs> We, we know so little in comparison. Matter of fact, the scripture says that when he comes for us and we all enter into the new, new Jerusalem and we all are sat down to be taught by Jesus, the scripture says that all of us, uh, when he teaches us, we will all realize that everything we have learned, everything we have discovered, everything we have come to know up until this point, when we are face to face with him and he is teaching us in our glorified bodies and we're able to understand, uh, to, to see him and behold him as he is, in that day, we will realize that everything we've learned up until this point was just a drop in the bucket, just a drop in the bucket compared to all that there is to know. I mean, think about this. God, when he was manifest in the flesh, Jesus walking on the earth, the scripture says, even what we know about the works that Jesus did, we, we have 66 books of this Bible, the New Testament we have where it, it outlines uh, the works of Jesus. We see through the Gospels, we see through Acts, we see all of this stuff. But the scripture tells us that even when God was manifest in the flesh and walking amongst us and we were beholding his glory, the scripture says that if books were to be written about all of the works that he did, all of the acts that he did while he was just physically on the earth walking among us, the books couldn't contain it. The, there wouldn't be an, uh, enough books to contain all that he did, all that he accomplished. So we got to understand that there is a, a there is a discovery that God has built into this process. There is a, a seek and a hunger and a desire that God has built into us. It is that God-sized void in our hearts and in our souls that, that longs for him to, uh, and in that seek, in that pursuit, one of my favorite, all-time favorite scriptures, book of Philippians. Philippians says this, not as though I've already attained, neither am I already made perfect, but I, uh, uh, something essentially says something has touched me. He said, not as though I've already attained, neither am I already made perfect, but that I might, um, somebody help me with the scripture. Let, let me pull that up real quick because I got to say it to you the, the, right, the right way or else I'm going to mess up. Not as though I've already attained. I know the scripture by heart and I've repeated it a million times. And of course, tonight I draw, draw a blank. Let me see. Already attained. Philippians 3, 12, Philippians 3, not as though I've already attained, neither have I already been made perfect, but I follow after that, that I might apprehend that for which also I've been apprehended of Christ Jesus. Paul was saying, I'm not perfect. I haven't reached full maturity yet. I'm on, I'm on a journey. I'm in process, but something has got a hold of me and I can't shake it. Something has touched me and I can't stop until I have gotten a hold of that thing that has gotten a hold of me. That journey, that is literally how Paul is describing here in the book of Philippians, this process of maturity with Jesus. That's where God wants to get us to in our walk with God, where we can uh, uh, come to this place of growth and maturity, where it becomes really a journey of discovery, of learning of him. And the scripture tells us this, 
That is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to seek it out or to search it out. God loves when we search for him with all of our heart. He loves when we run after him and when we desire to know, to know him. The scripture says that this is eternal life, that we might know him, that we might know him. I hope this is making sense. I hope this is blessing you. So all in all is to say this, there are levels to faith. There are sides of faith. There are versions of faith. And there is so much out there that we can have uh, if we would just lean into the mystery, lean into the seek, lean into the search and allow God to speak to us. You know, sometimes we pray and we, you know, pray for a few minutes and we just run out of things to pray about. And we're just like, amen, and be done and go about our day. If, if you can only pray for five or 10 minutes, that's fine. But don't think that the prayer has to be over. He's the creator of the universe. He knows all things. And surely he has some things that he wants to speak to you about. Surely he can tell you some things and reveal some things to you and bring you into a mystery and stir up desire and stir up hunger. He can do that. So we have to lean into it. This is the work of faith. So there are mysteries he wants to reveal, truth he wants to give. There are things he wants to unlock. Uh, for you and for your family and for your community and in an instant. But if we're so focused on the things of this world, we will miss it. Uh, the scripture tells us in Romans 1, Romans chapter number 1, 16 and 17. Romans chapter number 1, 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, from faith to faith, from faith to faith. Are y'all with me tonight? As you grow and as you mature and as you are perfected by the work of the Holy Ghost, uh, by the faith that comes by the hearing of the word of God, you learn more about the righteousness of God. And that righteousness is developed in you as you go from faith to faith. It's as you learn and as you discover and as you uncover, these mysteries are revealed to you by the spirit of God. And you learn more about the righteousness of God. You learn about his character, his person, his will. You learn his righteousness. There are things that you might not grasp and things that you might not understand right now at your level of faith. But as you grow and as you move from faith to faith, he'll show you things that just make sense. Things will click and you'll grasp it. Like when I was in the world, when I was coming out of perversion, the Lord saved me and he was bringing me out of lifestyles of perversion. And people used to always say, you know, oh, it's an agenda. It's an agenda. It's an agenda. And when I was in the world, I was so confused by that because I was thinking to myself like, that doesn't make any sense. I have no agenda. I just want to love who I love and, you know, blah, 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 blah. I didn't grasp it until years later when I came out of it and the Lord, the Lord began to purge me and I began to walk out this deliverance. And then I began to see it's not individual people who have an agenda. It is a spirit behind the entire work which has an agenda. And that spirit's agenda is at work in the world. Are y'all with me? So we come, we learn, we grow, we come to the knowledge of God, and he allows us to, to have his righteousness revealed from faith to faith. It is in direct relation to this that we must view his next statement. He says in, in that scripture in Romans, he says, the just shall what? What's the next verse? What does he say after that? That we learn the righteousness of God. It's revealed to us from faith to faith. And then he says, we must live by faith. He said, we live by faith. Are y'all with me? We are a people who live by faith. This is uh, why it's foundational doctrine. Understanding faith toward God is important because it's not just how we got saved, but, but because it is how we live. So you got to understand this foundational doctrine of faith towards God in its simplest forms, because it is literally how we live. It's how we go from day to day, the life that I now live. I live by faith in the Son of God. That's what the, the scripture says. We live by faith. We live by faith. I hope this is making sense. All right, let me see where I'm at. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, Galatians 2.20, I just quoted actually, the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. He basically was saying, Paul died. Paul died a long time ago. And the life that I'm living now, it's by faith in Jesus. Now, this is key. And I really want you to hear this. To live by faith means you have to die. Scripture says 
uh, that we are to die daily, dying daily. We have to die daily. I think I talked about this in one of the earlier sessions, but there is a dying that allows us to come alive in faith. There are parts of us that, that uh, pe- there's a lot of people who, for real, for real, you're not faithing, you're faking. <laughs> you're not faithing, you're faking. And you're, it's fake because you haven't died. You have to die to yourself. You have to die to your right, to your life, to all of this that is you. You know, me, 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 I, I, I. All of that has to die so that you can come alive to faith. When he said the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. A lot of people are living by faith in the Son of God. You're living your life by you. You're living your your life by the, the arm of the flesh. You're living your life by your own personality, your own strength, your own this, your own that. And so you have to be able to come to a place in your walk with God where you come down in your own estimation of yourself so God can birth you in true faith. It's a work of the Holy Ghost. You literally have to have to allow the Lord to kill the parts of you that are still alive that are hindering faith. There are even people who have a partial, a partial faith, if you will, like some faith, but that faith is hindered by the part of you that won't die. You have to allow the Lord to, to it's like what the scripture says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. That presenting, when it says reasonable service, if I put it in, in, in modern terms or my own terms, it's to say it's the least you could do. It really is the least you could do is to surrender to God. That surrender is the least, right? It's entry level. That self-sacrifice is entry level Christianity. But if you can master that, then faith can be birthed in you. And it is a faith that will allow you to live. It's a faith that will allow you to say, Carl died February a long, long time. I don't know, it's been like 20 years now. Uh, Carl Wright died. He is dead. And so the life I now live, I live by Jesus. And you can't kill a dead man. You can't hurt me. Your opinions can't hurt me. Your uh, feelings can't hurt me. The life I live, I don't dictate to my life based on my personal interpretation of what I feel is right and wrong. No, I live by faith in the son of God, his, his life informs my life. And so the life that I live, the decisions I make, the way I move about my world is dictated by the life of Christ, by the life of Christ. It's foundational. This is foundational. All right. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. I hope this is blessing you so far. We're only in the beginning. We're going to wrap up, but we're just at hitting this beginning stages. All right. Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, verse 6, Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 6 tells us this, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You can't even please God without faith. And something worth noting here is that faith begins with this simple statement, God is. Every level of faith begins with that declaration, God is, he is. And he gives a clarifier here. Not only is he, he is, the, what, what the old praying saints used to say, the big he, <laughs> right? He is and He is a rewarder to all of you who will diligently seek him. You can guarantee it that if you seek him, he's going to reward that. He's going to reward that diligent seek. He's a rewarder of them that seek him. That statement alone should cause something in you to want to respond. That statement, God is, he is knowable. He is attainable. I can know him. I can talk to him. Every level of faith begins with that statement, God is. Sometimes you have to go through your life and go through circumstances with that declaration of faith, God is is. God is. Even when everything around you is saying the opposite of what you're faithing, saying the opposite of what you're believing, you have to go through life declaring that to every situation, to your atmosphere. No, God is. God is. And because he is, hallelujah. What does songwriter say? Because he is, I can face tomorrow. Because he is, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In repentance, one turns 
from sin. But in faith, one turns towards God. It literally is the second half of that entry level stop to repent and believe. You repent and you turn away from sin, right? And then you turn toward God. Once we turn, we have to make movement. We talked about this. Faith will move you toward God and will continue to move you closer and closer with every step. All right. So let's talk about real quick what faith is not. Here, here's a few things we're going to list out because if we want to understand what something is. We need to give it some definition so that you can understand what it is not, what faith is not. Faith is not a mental ascent. This is really important, especially in today's world. Faith is not a mental ascent. A mental ascent is simply an agreement of historical and doctrinal facts about Christ, God, and the Bible. It is just an acknowledgement that he was. There is nothing wrong with a mental ascent, but it is not faith. To lean on a mental ascent as if it was faith is the faith of devils. It is the faith of devils. Let's look at James. James chapter number two. Y'all put James chapter two, 17 to 20 in the comments. James chapter number two. 17 to 20 in the comments. To lean on a mental ascent as if it is faith is the faith of devils. Are y'all in James chapter number two? I'm gonna wait for a couple more people to drop it in the comments so I know you're with me. James chapter number two, 17 to 20. 17 to 20. A mental ascent. There you go. All right. A mental ascent. James 2 verse 17 says this. This also faith by itself, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well for believing that. Even the demons believe. I hope y'all see this tonight. Y'all looking in the Bible. I, I didn't say it. It's, it's written here in the book of James. He says, you're saying that you believe that there is one true God. Beautiful. I'm so glad you say you believe in Jesus. That's great. You say, you, you know, I, I believe in Jesus. You know, I'm a believer. I believe. Wonderful. You do well by believing. That's great. But even the demons believe. And they tremble, but you do, it's, but scripture says, but do you want to know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? He was saying here, if you really believe, and not just the faith of devils, because Satan believes, but if you really believe, there should be some works you should follow. Your life should speak of it. Produce works that testify of what it is you believe. Don't just say you believe. Even demons do that. <laughs> All right. I'm not going to harp on it. A mental ascent. To lean on a mental ascent only. To say, you know, I believe Jesus. He, he was here. His, the history books say he was here. You know, you know, he was a good man. He was a teacher. Some say he was this. Some say he was that. You know, that's the faith of devils. The faith of devils is to believe, just to simply believe that he existed. All right? What faith is not? Faith is not a mental ascent. Faith is not presumption. Faith is not a presumption. This is to take for granted. To suppose to be true without positive proof. Presumptions imitate faith. Let me say it again. Presumptions imitate faith. Its characteristics are arrogance, rude, and even insulting behavior. Let's look at Hebrews 11.29. Hebrews 11.29. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29. It says this. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry, dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do the same, what, what does it say happened? The children of Israel passed through the Red Sea on dry land. The Red Sea opened up, and they were able to pass through. And the Egyptians attempted to do the same, but what happened? Y'all see the word of God? The scripture says they were drowned. Hebrews 11.29. The Egyptians, the Egyptians tried to do what the children of God did by faith. 
The Egyptians attempted to do so too, say, oh, look what they could do. The children of God passed through on dry land. It was an act of faith. They were trapped at the Red Sea. They didn't know where to go. God says, Moses, lift up your stick. I want you to imagine this, y'all, tonight, just for a minute here as, as we're on. And I hope y'all are engaging with me tonight. I hope you're resisting distractions, that you're tuned in, locked in, right? But imagine this. We, in 2023, we have the privilege of reading the book. We, we read the story. And so we forget that these people that we read about, they didn't get to read the book. They're living it in real time. Moses didn't know what would happen. The children of Israel didn't know what would happen. God brings them out of 400 years of Egyptian bondage in slavery, brings them out to the wilderness by miraculous uh, uh, bringing them out, miraculous deliverance. Here they are, they're rejoicing, they're celebrating, they're getting out into the wilderness where they're going to be able to worship God freely, and they come upon a block, they come upon a hindrance. And here's this Red Sea in front of them, and they're stuck. They're trapped in nowhere to go. At this point, not only were they leaving freely, but Pharaoh and his army is on their tracks. They've decided to run after them. So the children of Israel are in the, in the desert. They're at the Red Sea, and uh, they're stuck. They're stuck at the Red Sea, nowhere to go, and their enemy is almost on them. They're on their tracks. They can hear the chair, the wheels of the chariot right behind them, and they're all looking at Moses, and they're all looking at Moses like, oh my, this, you brought us out here to die? You, is this what you did, right? Moses prays. God says to Moses, Moses, lift up your staff. Moses, by faith. By faith, lifts up his staff, and the scripture says that the sea opens up. It opens up, and he tells them to go across. The children of Israel, by faith now, y'all, they're, they're obeying God, following God. It's an act of faith. They begin to cross over. The scripture says that the Egyptians, seeing what's happening, they're witnessing this miracle in real time, and they're saying, wow, we, if, look, they can do it. We can do it too. They're getting across just fine. Ain't nothing going to happen to us. I can just hear the Egyptians, you know, some of the doubting Egyptians like, I don't know, you know, who knows how them uh, walls of water are being stabilized. We don't know what, what could happen if we get out there and, and, and it comes crashing down. And here the Egyptians say, uh-uh, no, look, it, it's working for them. They're getting across just fine. So here go the Egyptians. The scripture says, attempting to do the same. They go to cross over. When that last Egyptian gets his toe across from that where that start of that river point begins, the scripture says that they were drowned. What God used for deliverance for the children of Israel, he used as judgment against his enemies. The Egyptians presumed faith, and it was dangerous. It was treacherous for them, right? They presumed it would work for them, and they drown. Presumption can be very, very dangerous. Presumption, a presumption upon faith is not true faith. Let's look at when, when Peter was walking on water. Y'all know the story of Peter walking on water? Presumption is not true faith. It's not true faith. Uh, here is Peter. He's, uh, uh, y'all know the story, he's on the boat. Uh, Jesus comes, and they're all looking like, oh, is it a ghost, right? And Jesus says, Peter, walk to me. Peter, come on out on this water, right? So, so Jesus bids Peter to come. Peter steps out of the boat and begins to walk on top of the water. Uh, but what you got to know, what you got to understand is that Peter was not just walking on water. Peter was walking on a word. He had a word from God. He stepped out on faith, and it was his faith in the word of God that, that held him up. Are y'all with me? So uh, by faith, Peter steps out on his word and his word sustained him. If the other disciples said, oh, I want to walk on water too, and they had tried to follow Peter, they would have sunk because Jesus did not ask them to come. He did not bid them to come. He did not give them a word. It would have been presumed. They didn't have that word from God. They can't presume upon God. He hadn't told them to walk on water. Are y'all with me? Their presumption would have been costly. True faith is not rooted in presumption. It's rooted in the word of God. True faith is not rooted in presumption. It is rooted in the word of God. All right? So we're talking about what faith is not. Hallelujah. Let me make sure we're 
Everyone's muted here. I'm going to mute you. All right, everybody's muted. I think we're still in focus mode. Okay. All right, so faith is not a presumption. Y'all with me? All right, we're talking about what faith is not. Faith is not natural reasoning. Somebody say natural reasoning in the comments. Natural reasoning. So faith is not a mental ascent. Faith is not presumption. And faith is not natural reasoning. Faith is not natural reasoning. Natural reasoning is based on things seen, visible and temporal. I hope this is blessing you tonight. And I hope you're being stretched. I hope you're growing. I hope your spirit man is being stirred. All right. So faith is not natural reasoning. It's not based on uh, things seen, visible, or temporal. Let's look at Matthew 16. Matthew chapter number 16, verse 1 through 4. Matthew 16, verse 1 through 4. Y'all drop that in the comments for me, all right? Matthew 16, verse 1 through 4. It says this. Hallelujah. It says, Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it'll be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. As a side note here, this is a very important scripture, especially for today's age and the day that we live in. The scripture says it is a wicked and perverse generation that seeks after a sign. There are people that are longing for signs. They're chasing signs and wonders, like nothing wrong with signs and wonders and miracles. They follow believers. But y'all got to understand order here. Signs and wonders do what? I want y'all to, those of you that read your Bibles, signs and wonders do what? Signs and wonders follow. They follow them that believe. Believers don't follow signs and wonders. <laughs> Are y'all with me? We're not chasing after signs and wonders. Signs and wonders follow believers. Don't the scripture says in the last days there will be many false Jesuses and many false signs and wonders, and people will grope after these things because they're desiring, they're longing for a sign and a wonder. And the scripture says here in Matthew 16, they're not getting one. <laughs> They're not getting one. Matter of fact, he says the only sign for them will be the sign of the prophet Jonah. What did Jonah do? Jonah went down to Nineveh and he preached to them, repent. That, that is the call of the end time message is a message of repentance. Don't you, these people that are running, looking for signs and wonders, where are the miracles? Where are the signs? Where are the miracles? Repent. Repent for the day of the Lord is at hand. Are y'all with me? But signs and wonders will follow them that believe. And they're going to follow us. The signs, the wonders, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be powerful. It's going to be mind-blowing. The, the testimonies that will come. But please understand that these things follow the preaching of the gospel. These things follow them that believe. Don't If you have signs and wonders, but you don't have people believing, you don't have people being transformed, it's a lying sign and a wonder. Are y'all with me? So natural reasoning, we're talking about natural reasoning. There is an ability to have natural reasoning, right? One plus one equals two. What goes up must come down. It's logic. There's natural reasoning. If there's an orange chair in front of you, and you may say, you know, this chair is orange. Why? Because it's natural logic. You're able to see it with your eye, perceive it. It's like when Elijah was cutting down the trees uh, and his axe head fell off into the water. Obviously, the axe is heavier than the water, so it sinks to the bottom. But he prayed. Y'all know the story? He prayed. Elisha prayed. And the accent begins to float. It defies natural logic. It defies the order of things. Natural reasoning would look and say, that doesn't make sense because the metal of the accent is heavier than the water. Therefore, it should sink. Natural reasoning, it's logic. Whereas faith gives you the ability to say, I know the accent is supposed to, to um, sink, but I know God said uh, for me to move in faith. And, and Cindy Trim, you ever heard Cindy Trim preach? She said, Cindy Trim, uh, God said, speak to the water. Water, change your molecular structure. The water becomes heavier than the accent and the ax floats up. It defies natural reasoning. It defies logic. Faith is not natural reasoning. Are y'all with me? 
Faith is not natural reason. Okay. All right. Let's talk about what faith is. We're almost done tonight. We're almost done. Shout out to y'all holding it down in the comments. Appreciate you guys. What faith is. Let's talk about what faith is. Faith is a confidence, a trust, an assurance in another and in another's word. The word for faith we see in Hebrews 11, chapter, or chapter 11, verse number one, where it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's translated from the Greek word pistis, P-I-S. T-I-S, P-I-S, T-I-S, is the Greek word pistis. It means persuasion, credence, moral conviction of religious truth or the truthfulness of God or a religious teacher, especially reliance upon Christ for salvation, assurance, belief, faith, fidelity. This concept of faith that we see through the text is saying to us, it's not natural reasoning a mental ascent. It's not our logic, but rather it is a persuasion. It is a conviction at the deepest parts of who we are that we believe. It is that hoping against hope that having done all to stand, you keep on standing. It's that thing that at the end of the day, you hold on to. It is faith. Faith is instantaneous. It is progressive and it is ultimate. Though faith is a basic of foundational principles, there are many people who don't know how to operate in true faith. A person can go through all of their church and religious motions and still miss God if there is no faith. Are y'all with me? You can get a hobby, you can come to church, but unless things are appropriated by faith, you have wasted your life. Can y'all imagine going your whole life in church, in religious activity, Wasting your life because you never actually learned how to appropriate faith. You never uh, learned how to allow faith to come alive. You just went through the motions. Are y'all with me? Okay, let me see where I'm at. Uh, okay, so you have to ask yourself this question. Do you believe? Do you believe? And if you do, then you must be fully persuaded. You have to know that the devil, the issues of life, the trials and the tribulations of this world, your own ate up mind will war against the concept of faith constantly, constantly. All right. It is because faith is the portal, if you will, by which we access all the things of God to believe that he is. You want to know what your purpose is. You want to know what you're called to and what God put you in the earth to do. All of that is access. By faith, it's not a mental ascent. You can look at what you're good at, but what you're good at uh, uh, might not necessarily be what you're called to do. Are y'all with me? You can, you can look at what you're good at, the things that you like to do, the things that you're passionate about, but even what you are called and purposed to do has to be accessed by faith because if you just access those things by natural logic, you can be doing a whole lot of, of stuff and God has nothing to do with it. Well, I'm just so passionate about this. and. God have you do stuff all day that ain't got nothing to do with what you're passionate about. God might ask you to do something you don't even want to do. You don't even like to do. Some, I've heard people say, literally say, well, if you don't like to do it or you're not, you're not passionate about it, then God wouldn't call you to it. And that's not your purpose. That's not true. That's not biblical at all. There are plenty of examples in scripture. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh so bad that he ran the other way, he ended up having to throw himself off of a ship so that he could end up in the will of God. God doesn't always call us to what we're passionate about or what we're good at. Sometimes God will even ask you to leave behind the things that you are good at and go after what he has called you to do. For myself, I never imagined that I would be a preacher. I never imagined that I would be a pastor. No, I wanted to go to school for nursing. I wanted to go to school for nursing. Now, God knows all things because the truth be told, you know, now looking back, I don't know how I would have survived because I don't do bodily fluids well. <laughs> Are y'all with me? And from what I'm told, you start out in nursing, you know, they call it scud work. That's what you got to do. You got to clean the people up. But the truth, the truth is that 
I, I, I would have never considered public speaking. I would have never considered uh, walking people through life's issues and walking people through traumatic experiences and helping people to uh, uh, translate the gospel into every area of their life. I would never would imagine. My life was jacked up. My life was messed up. My journey has been anything but perfect. Surely there are people who are better qualified to do this. Surely there are people who uh, fit the mold better than me. But at the end of the day, the purpose of God in my life on my life is not dictated by what I feel is good or what I'm good at or what is uh, uh, the easiest road. I hope this is making sense. Uh, ultimately, God will never create for you a life that makes him unnecessary. God will never create a life for you that makes him unnecessary, especially for those of you that are born again believers. God will never create for you a life that makes him unnecessary. Nine times out of 10, the things that you are called to do. Here's a, for instance, there are a lot of things that I'm good at. A lot of things I'm good at. Some people even say you're called to it or you're anointed for it. But here's the truth. I'm good at graphic design. I design stuff like this all the time. I, I like doing graphic design. I have a, a little side business. And I, tell, I jokingly tell people this because if I gave my side business the time and attention that I could, and who knows what the future may hold, I may do so in the future. But if I gave the time and attention to that business, if I charge the prices, industry standard, all of that stuff, I really could have a very thriving, thriving business. And it's, it's already thriving just being my little side business. But I have no intention of doing that. Why? Because I'm giving my time and attention to what I know I'm purposed and called to do, which is ministry. That is my first thing that I'm uh, giving my attention to outside of my family. My wife and kids come first, right? We know that my relationship with God, but it's not what I'm called to do. I'm good at that. I'm good at being creative. I'm good at uh, planning. I'm good at logistics. I'm good at a whole lot of things. And I do those things. I love doing those things, but it's not what I'm called to do, what I'm purposed to do. The thing that I am purposed to do is actually not the thing that comes natural to me, believe it or not. The thing that I'm purposed to do, the thing that I'm called by God to do, the thing that I'm actually anointed to do is the thing that I need God to do. It's the thing that I can't do without him, right? Now I can preach without Jesus, but I can't uh, uh, preach to lead to transform lives without the Holy Ghost. I can't, I can have church I can have church without Jesus. That's why I'm so much more than just a church preacher, so much more than just church. I am a, 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 a voice. I am a, a person. I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to give you an example through my own experience. I am called to amplify the voice of God in the earth. That takes consecration. That takes leaning on God. That takes prayer. That takes study. That takes preparation. That takes a, 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 a surrendering. I need him. I need him because I am messed up. Are you with me? So the thing I'm called and purpose to do is something that I need God for. Think about it like this. I'm gonna get back to my notes, right? So y'all, so y'all don't say I just told a story to you the whole time. <laughs> Think about this. Jesus walks up to some fishermen who are professionals. Y'all know the in uh uh the gospels when Jesus called the disciples, the first disciples, the fishermen. They were professional fishermen. It, it, it was what they did. It was their career, all right? They went out, they caught fish, and then they took those fish, they sold them at market, and they used that money to handle their business, to, to raise their families, all of that stuff. They were professionals. It's what they did. They catch fish, they sell it, uh, and they're good at it. It comes natural to them. They've been out there fishing all night long, all day long, and they hadn't caught anything. They were tired, they were frustrated, and I'm sure they weren't in the mood, but here comes Jesus on the scene. He's not a fisherman. <laughs> Jesus is a carpenter's son. Here comes Jesus, a stranger to them, and he comes on the scene. And he says, hey, cast your net on the other side. I'm sure they were looking like, come on, uh, this is what we do. <laughs> don't, don't tell me how to do my job, right? But I'm sure they were looking at him like that. But what do they do? They cast their net. They cast their net. So they obeyed. They cast their nets. And the scripture says, immediately, immediately, their nets were full. So full that when they were bringing up their nets into the boat, their nets were breaking. They were amazed. And on their best day, after having caught uh, the most fish they have ever caught, Jesus bids them, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that then they all, this is what they do every day. They fish, right? They're business people. And on their best business day, the bottom line was good. <laughs> they were successful. They had brought in all of this fish. Jesus says, all right, 
I want you to stop fishing the way you've always fished. And I want you to come follow me. I'm actually going to transform your life. I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm sure that had to be challenging. But the scripture says immediately, immediately they drop their nets and they follow him. Do you know why? Because when you have an encounter with God and you see what he is capable of doing, you see that he's capable of anything. There has to be something in our spirit that says, all right, whatever you say, because I've seen what you can do. There's an old song, old gospel song says, I've seen him do it. I've seen him do it. God can do anything. So when you have an encounter like that, there's a faith move that challenges logical thinking. Business people and people of the world would have said, no, nah, bro, this is your most successful day. Don't quit. Don't give up the job. Don't give up the business. Don't go follow him. Let's stay here. Let's keep throwing our nets in. Let's see how much fish. Today was good. Tomorrow might be good too. But no, an act of faith, they obeyed. Faith led them to obediently follow him. Look at what the writer said. Oh, let me see where I'm at. All right. As you go on from these uh, foundational principles and you go on into a maturity, you get established in a track record with God. This is why testimonies are so important because I may not have experienced what you have experienced, but God, when God brings me in to certain things or, or takes me through certain things and wants me to trust him, I can remember uh, that sister so-and-so testified about how God did X, Y, Z. I can remember about how brother so-and-so testified about how God brought them through it and it builds my faith, all right? So your testimony is like, y'all know the scriptures? So faith, this building up of faith, testimonies build faith. Testimonies activate faith. Even your faith to step out and share your testimony builds faith for someone else. You know in the scripture when it says, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, uh, and it lists out the God of all these people? That's legacy. That's testimony. But do you know that the same can be said about you when you testify about how God brought you over and how God brought you out for somebody who's never been through it and they're just now coming into that level and they're just now experiencing some of these things? They can say, you know, the God of Shantae. God, I'm praying to the God of Shantae. You brought her through. I know you can do it for me. I'm praying to the God of Jill Murray. Lord, you brought her through. You healed her body. I know you can do it for me. Father, I'm praying to the God of Whitney Johnson. I've seen you do it for her. I heard her testify about it. I remember when she told the story. And so I'm praying to the God of her. You, you can do it for me. Testimony builds faith. Testimony builds faith. Faith is released uh, when God's promises are confessed with the mouth and believed on in the heart. Let me repeat that. Faith is released when God's promises are confessed with the mouth and believed on in the heart. Faith is a seed. It is, uh, it may be small, it may be just you know, the size of a mustard seed, but when it is real, it is mountain moving. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You have to sometimes, and I really, really need this, you have to sometimes take the promises of God's word and confess them out loud. You may be saying, oh, I don't do that. That's not my test. That's not my uh, uh, personality. That's weird. You know, I don't talk to myself. Talk to yourself. Talk to yourself. Don't just talk to yourself. Talk to your atmosphere. Talk to demons. Talk to angels. Talk. talk. I'm not saying like get weird, new agey, but y'all get what I'm saying? I'm saying speak out of your mouth and declare the promises of God. Because without your uh, because without your vocal cords, it's uh, just running through your mind anyway. It's just running through your mind anyway. Your voice, God's voice, and the devil's voice. It's all running through there. Sometimes uh, you need to talk out loud and get louder than the voice of your accuser. Those three voices are three voices that you need to learn and you need to master. I'm going to pause here for a second. Your voice, God's voice, and the devil's voice. Now, most of you know your voice for the most part. You've had it your whole life, right? It's those that you know. Then the devil's voice. The devil's voice has been, been with you for a long time, too. That old accuser of the brethren. Many of you, uh, if you're new to the faith or if you're just, you know, coming uh, uh, alive in these areas, or maybe you've been in it for a while, but your ears have become numb. The voice of God being developed in your life, you have to learn how to hear that. And the reason I say talk it out loud, take the Bible, the word of God, declare the scriptures out loud is because that stuff is all in there anyway. It's all running through there. And so as you discern and are able to tell the difference, you have to give uh, heed and even amplify the voice of God in your own heart and in your own mind and in your own home and in your own community, amplify the voice of God. The book of Isaiah 
says, uh, plant the heavens with the seed of God's word. Plant the heavens with the seed of God's word. The best way I can say it to you is this. Here's a principle for spiritual warfare, right? We are spiritual beings. There is an entire spiritual world all around us that is very real. It is very real. Like uh, up above us right now in the third heaven, there is an actual throne. There is an actual throne. And on that throne sits a very real God who around his throne right now, this is not allegory. It's not symbolism. It's actually happening right now in real time up in the third heaven in the throne room of God. There are angels going around the throne of God crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And they're not crying that out because they're just robots like, oh, holy, 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 holy. No, when they, their, their literal job is to behold him, to gaze at him, to look at him. And every time they come around the throne, they behold something about God that they've never beheld before. They look and see something that they've never been seen before, and it provokes them to cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. There is a spiritual realm that is real. And the scripture tells us that angels, this is a side note, just a key for spiritual warfare. This is the whole concept of, of declaring the, the principles and the promises of God. The scripture says, that angels are the helps ministers of God, right? They are uh, there to minister to the heirs of salvation. And the scripture tells us that they uh, heed the voice of the word of God. Angels, which are very real, heed the voice of the word of God. They don't obey our voice. Let me say this again. You don't have your angels, Right. This is why you can't just be in here like, oh, Father, we call on the African angels, angels that come from Africa. What are you talking about? They don't obey you. They don't respond to your voice. The scripture says that the angels respond to the voice of God's word. So in Isaiah, when it says we plant the heavens with the seed of the word of God, why do we do that? Because the scripture tells us in the book of Ephesians that the word of God is the sword of the spirit, taking up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So when you get the promises of God and the word of God over your life, over your loved ones, over your family, over your church, over your community, over your nation, you pray the word of God, what happens is you ascend in the place of prayer and you plant the heavens with the word of God or with swords, literal swords, and angels then take that word as a sword and they begin to battle on your behalf. They begin to battle, hallelujah, and respond to the voice of his word. They begin to bring things to pass. They begin, hallelujah, to bring forth all of God's promises. This is why the scripture said that, uh, uh, I don't remember, y'all have to help me here, but it was when the the Daniel. Daniel prayed, and the scripture said that from the moment he prayed, y'all hear this, the scripture said the moment he prayed, the answers were released. But what happened? Because he didn't get an answer right away. He prayed, the answer was released, but the scripture says that the, the answer was held up in the realm of the spirit. The prince of Persia uh, uh, hindered them. And so for 21 days, there was a battle going on in the realm of the spirit to get the answer to Daniel. Hallelujah. I wish y'all was hearing what I'm trying to say. Or what, what they say. I wish y'all was picking up when I'm putting down. Essentially, this there is warfare going on in the realm of the spirit to hinder the work of God, to hinder the plan of God, to frustrate the grace of God, all of these things. But when you pray the word of God, you literally give ammunition, hallelujah, to the helps ministers of God, for which they're able to use to fight and to war, to bring God's will to pass. Let me move on. We're talking about faith. I'm going to amen myself tonight. All right. Hallelujah. So you have to talk out loud. Uh, you have to get louder than the voice of the accuser that's in your ear. Don't let the devil beat you up. Take the word of God and begin to declare it out loud. Even if you don't believe it, keep on declaring it. You speak it until you believe it. Faith is activated when you declare with the mouth and believe in the heart. Faith is activated when you declare with the mouth and believe in the heart. So when you declare and declare and declare the word of God, you speak to your own heart. You command your soul what it's going to believe. I speak to my mind. I speak to my heart. I speak to my soul. You will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I know, hallelujah, you might feel cast down. This is what he says. Look at the writer in Psalm 42, 5. Let me give you the word. Psalm 42, 5. Y'all look at that. Psalm 42, verse 5. 
The writer says here, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. He felt himself slipping on the inside. He felt himself slipping into depression, and he began to speak to himself and to make declaration, lift up your head. You have to declare the word of God. I know I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You may say money might be tight, things might not be working out the way they were supposed to, but I have promises from God. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed beg for bread. Family, we may, your family may be acting up, but you have to begin to declare the word of God. I see what's happening. I see, you know, the facts, but I declare by faith the truth of the word of God. Hallelujah. And the truth is that the promise is unto me and my household. He promised me that salvation belonged to my household household. He promised me that it was coming. I know it might not look like it, but the scripture promised it. And so I'm going to keep on declaring it, keep on believing it, keep on standing on the word of God. This is faith towards God. You have to declare the promises of God out of your mouth. This is faith towards God. It's a principle that will keep you and cause you to go the distance. You got to declare out of your mouth what thus says the Lord, whose report will you believe? Do what you got to do. Handle your business, right? But you need to be able to declare over yourself the word of the Lord. The promises of God by the shed blood of Jesus are Calvary facts. And I'm going to declare it out of my mouth and believe it in my heart. Faith is activated. All right? All right. So faith is, we're talking about what faith is. Faith is confidence, trust, all of that, right? Faith is a spiritual sense. We're almost done tonight. We're going to wrap up. Faith is a spiritual sense. Shout out to those of you still holding on with me. If you're still with me in the comments, say amen. Let me see you there. Hello, hello. We're, we're almost done. All right. Faith is, I see you, I see you, I see you. Faith is a spiritual sense. Faith is a spiritual sense, just as you have your natural senses, like sight, sound, touch. In the same manner, there are spiritual senses. Psalm 34 and verse 8 says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. There are spiritual senses. It goes on in Acts 17, 27 to say, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grow up or feel for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us, you have to feel after him. You have to command your feelings and your senses. There is a spiritual sense and it is faith. Psalm 45 verse 8 says this, all of your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad. You have to allow all of your senses to be engaged by the Holy Ghost. I pray frequently, frequently I pray this, God shut my senses down in the natural and open them up in the realm of the spirit. I want to see you. I want to feel you. I want to know you. Help me to discern you by my spiritual senses by my spiritual senses, like literally, and I know this might seem odd maybe, but you can be in, in, in realms in the spirit or places in the spirit or discerning by the spirit. There, you can smell things. You can smell things that smell godly or even ungodly. I'm not talking about natural senses here. I'm talking about a spiritual sense. I remember back in the day, the old mothers, they used to walk by you and they say, I smell sin, smell like sin, right? I've had moments where I've had these uh, uh, really intense moments where like I would be in a situation I could smell. I don't know how to explain it other than like a, the fragrance of God. And I would be like, man, no, the Lord is here. I'm telling you. So there are spiritual senses, spiritual sense of faith. All right, let's talk about the source of faith. What is the source of faith? The source of faith. The source of faith is the word of God. The word of God is the source of faith. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the word. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the, what's, what's that word there? For me, I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. <laughs> the source of faith, the book for me. Thank you, Cassandra. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. The source of faith is the word of God. I hope y'all still with me tonight. Romans 10, 17 says this. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hebrews 12, verse one through two says this. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, 
looking unto Jesus, hallelujah, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the, the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, let me make sure we're muted here. Sorry, y'all. All right. Kevin, Kevin Connor said it this way. There is but one true and proper source of faith, the word of God. If faith is not built upon the word, it can never stand the, the storms and tests of life. To truly hear the word is to hear the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to the heart by the spirit. The word is the Christ of God. The word is the Christ of God. All right, let's talk about the elements of faith. There are a couple elements of faith. I think we talked about this in the last session with repentance. There are a couple elements of faith. We're going to go over real quick. So note these down. First, there's intellectual. There's an intellectual element of faith. This is the knowledge aspect of faith. It is impossible to have faith without knowledge. It is impossible to have faith without knowledge. Uh, the scripture tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, right? So it's impossible to even activate faith without some kind of knowledge. Psalm 9, 10, uh, Psalm chapter 9, verse 10 tells us this. And those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. There is knowledge that is intellectual. It's the intellectual aspect of faith. Uh, and faith is built upon it. It brings us into a knowing, if you will. It's not like a knowing up here, a head knowledge, but it's a knowing in our knower, if you will. All right. And it builds in us faith. This scripture, Psalm 910, when it says, uh, and those who know your name will put trust in you. Uh, years ago, I was working in a prayer center, prayer line, and I prayed for this guy. And at the end of it, I said, Father, in, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And the man said, wow. Like when you said Jesus' name, something about like the way you said it, this is his exact words. He said it. It's like you just say it like you just know that it's like the stamp that's going to get the prayer up there. Right. And it's like it's a joke. You know, we laugh. But in all seriousness, when I pray, I really pray. In the name of Jesus, like I've been, I'm, I live in the name. I have a revelation of the name. And because I know his name, not just oh, Jesus, like I can say the, the letters, but I'm saying to you, I have revelation knowledge. I know it in my knower, not a head knowledge, not just a, a, a logic, but I have a, a revelation of faith built on spiritual knowledge. And because of that, the scripture tells us, uh, that the prayers of the righteous shall avail much. Y'all know that scripture? The prayers of the righteous shall avail much. Therefore, when I pray, I don't pray in Carl's name. I don't pray like, no, I pray in Jesus' name because I'm not righteous. All of my righteousness is as filthy rags. I've received his righteousness. And because I've received his righteousness, we talked about this earlier, the life that I now live, I live by faith in the son of God. So when I pray in Jesus' name, I expect this prayer to avail much. Why? Because it's rooted in his righteousness, because I know his name and I put my trust in him, right? It says in Psalm 910, those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. You, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. There is an emotional element to faith. There's an emotional element. So there's an intellectual, there's an emotional. This is the heart's response to faith. Feelings must not ever be mistaken as faith. This is so key. Your feelings are not your faith. Let me say it again. Your feelings are not, y'all with me? Your feelings are not your faith. Your feelings are fickle. They can change. They are not fact. They are just feelings, but faith will involve feelings. God's order is fact, faith, feeling. Fact, faith, feeling. Never the reverse. Never the reverse. Fact, faith, feeling. Matthew 13, verse 20 to 21 says this. But he who receives seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself. So he only endures for a little while. For when tribulation or persecution arise because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Immediately he stumbles. They heard, they had a feeling, but there was no root of faith. There is an order for a purpose and for a reason. God's order is fact faith, feeling. My feelings are informed by my faith. And because of faith, I'm able to, to engage all of my senses and all of my feelings. And I get to experience these things by faith. 
Alicia, that was Matthew 13, Matthew 13, verse 20 to 21, Matthew 13, 20 to 21. All right, and this is the last part of the elements of faith. There is a volitional element, a volitional. We talked about this before. Volitional means an act of your volition or an act of your will, your voluntary will. This is the will's appropriation of faith. When faith is activated in someone, it results in the act of making commitment or making, making decisions. Are y'all with me? We see in Ephesians 2, 5 through 8. Ephesians 2, 5 through 8, that faith is a gift from God. We have received this gift by faith. It says in Ephesians 2, 5 through 8, even when we were dead in trespasses and sin, you made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have saved us and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through through faith, right? Through faith that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. It is a gift of God. All of us, every single one of us, were deserving of the wrath of God. And our saving faith is not built. Y'all got to hear this. Our saving faith was not built on the love of God, but rather the grace of God that comes by faith. If we were saved by love, it would be that there was some kind of redeeming quality about us that caused us to be saved, but there was nothing about us that could cause us to be saved. The fact is that it was all him. Everything about our salvation was a work of his own doing. It was a work of his own doing. If we were saved by love, it would be that there was some kind of redeeming quality about us that caused us to be saved. There was no redeeming qualities. The fact is it was all him. Everything about our salvation was a work of his own doing. So by faith, we receive the gra we receive that grace, not of our own selves, lest we should boast, but it is the free gift of God. So there is faith that is a free gift from God, but that faith, faith must also be responded to. Let me, let me say it this way. It was an act of love that God extended grace towards us, but his love towards us was not because we were, was not because we were lovable. <laughs> Y'all got to hear this. We were born in sin, shaping in iniquity. There was no redeeming quality. Even our salvation is such a gift. You got to get that. It has everything to do with him, everything to do with God. It was all him. The fact that he set his love on us should really blow your mind and amaze you. Like, this is why the scripture, you see these people say this in scripture. I was a wretch. Uh, like, I, I'm a wretch undone. Isaiah said, he said, uh, uh, uh. When the scripture said, he said, take the cold, cleanse my lips. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I've done unclean things. He said, woe is me. The arrogance that we have in 2023, we approach God as if like we were worthy of him saving us. We weren't. We're dead in sin with our back turned to God with no redeeming quality. Hallelujah. But we have value only because he chose to set his value on us. He chose to set his love on us. And it is a gift. It is a gift. It's a gift of God. Romans 12, 2. Romans 12, 1 through 2. So there's faith, which is a free gift from God. Hallelujah. I feel the anointing. There is faith, which is a free gift from God, but that faith must be responded to. Romans 12, 1 through 2 tells us this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He says, present your body as a living sacrifice. And he tells us that it's our reasonable service. This response is an act of the will. This is the volitional uh, uh, element of faith. It's an act of the will. We respond to the grace of God that has come by faith, by surrendering, by giving up, by letting go. This response is an act of the will. It comes by faith. All right. All right. We're getting this last part and it's going to progress pretty quick. All right. And we're going to wrap up and pray. Progressing faith. Let's talk about progressing faith. Romans 1. I hope this is blessing you tonight. Romans 1 verse 17 tells us that the believer is called to proceed from faith to faith until he comes to the fullness of the Son of God. So there is a progression in faith. Faith grows, 
It progresses, it develops. You get to experience all the sides and the aspects of faith, but it is the call of God that we don't just stay at saving faith, but that we go all the way on to, to the fullness. So I'm going to give you a couple of um, progressing faith or marks of progressing faith, and I'm going to give you the scriptures, but I'm not going to read them. So mark them down and make sure you go read them, okay? So number one, saving faith. This is Ephesians 2 and 8. Ephesians 2, 8, Acts 16, 31, saving faith, saving faith. Ephesians 2, 8, Acts 16, 31. Number two, there is the fruit of faith, the fruit of faith. This is a, a, a fruit of the Holy Ghost, which he develops in us. This is Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of faith. Number three, there is the gift of faith. This is the gift of faith talked about in 1 Corinthians 12 and 9. 1 Corinthians 12 and 9, the gift of faith, okay? Then there's doctrinal faith. This is Jude chapter number 3, the whole chapter. And then 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. This is doctrinal faith. And then lastly is perfect faith or matured faith. And this is yet to be manifested. This is when all the saints come to perfection or full maturity. Then we will enter into that, what the scripture references, that perfect faith, that matured faith, or the fullness of the stature of the man Christ Jesus, all right? So this progression or embracing of the understanding that there is a growth process and a development that is taking place, not only uh, that, but that we actually won't get to perfect faith during this life, but that it's a process, it's a journey. This is very much like, um, uh, this is very much, the best way I could say it is like, this is what will keep you humble on your journey is to understand that none of us during this lifetime will arrive at full perfection or full maturity until we enter into the new Jerusalem and we're able to put off what the scripture calls our body of death and we're able to be clothed in our glorified body, then we will enter into the fullness of that, all right? Because we're being perfected and maturing, none of us will be able to say we've achieved until that day, all right? Hebrews 11 is noted as the faith chapter and some refer to it as the hall of faith or the hall of fame of faith, which highlights people who obtained by faith. We see and know that it is Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith. He starts faith. Nobody can even come to God except it is that the Lord draws them, right? So it's not you that is doing the work, but it is as you are going after him and as you seek him, he develops your faith, okay? He's the author. He is the finisher. So when, God, when God's got you in the place of stretching your faith or growing your faith or causing you to see different sides of faith, the goal cannot be to lean into your Christian doing. The goal has to be to lean into him. And if we lean into him, then the, the natural outgrowth is the producing of faith. We must keep looking to Jesus as we run our race. Uh, faith is a beautiful thing. It's a powerful force, but we have to be careful. Here's a, a warning, right? We have to be careful that we don't have faith in our faith. Oh, God. Let me say it again. We have to be careful that we don't have faith in our faith. Cautious that we do not deify our faith. The Bible teaches us to have faith in, in a faithful God that keeps his covenant to a thousand generations. This scripture is clear that it's impossible. The scripture is clear that it's impossible for God to lie. This is the object of our faith, not faith, our faith itself. Jesus said that we are to believe in him and on him. And if we are to have, then we will have everlasting life. It's not faith that we worship or deify. All right. We don't worship or deify faith. Let me see where I'm at. Uh, yes, it's him, the faithful God, the God who made the promise. He cannot lie. The God who said it, and it has to happen. God cannot lie. He is the spirit of truth. And because he is the spirit of truth, um, anything that comes out of his mouth is truth. Even if God would fix his mouth to, to tell a lie, the minute it comes out of his mouth, it would cease to be a lie. It would become truth because he is truth, all right? So you can lean in and push into the fact that God has made a promise and he will bring it to pass. Our Christian life begins in faith. So let's recall these last two scriptures, and I promise you it literally is my last notes. Just going to recall these. We read these earlier. I'm going to end with recalling them to you. Hebrews 11, verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. All right, Romans 1, 17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live 
by faith. As Christians, we begin in faith, we move by faith, and we must die in faith. No matter what you go through in this life, no matter what you might face or what happens, you must always hold on to your faith. Amen. Hallelujah. So that is faith towards God tonight. I hope that you were blessed. I hope you learned something. I hope you were stretched, that you grew. We're going to pray in just a minute. But before we do, uh, I'm going to just ask real quickly, any questions I can answer, anything I can share um, before we hop off here, we're just going to give this two minutes, not going to be long, just two, two, three minutes. Um, and we will hop off. What is the perfect mature faith scripture? Uh, let me see. Did I reference it? Mature. No, there's no scripture for that. That was that was it was a statement. Sorry. There's not a scripture reference. There's tons of scripture references about it though. I just don't have like one to pick, but it's all the scripture references where it talks about uh coming into the fullness of the stature of the man Christ Jesus. Uh uh per perfect faith. You talk about see when Jesus talks about the new Jerusalem, uh the glorified body, all of that is uh perfect faith. So you can choose any of those scriptures and they can all go there all right any other questions before we leave out you're welcome sister michelle love you sister lisa Cortland. thank you thank you can i email your questions separately yes sorry that was a personal message yes feel free if you have any questions that you don't want um answered directly in here you can definitely send me a message um personally and we could talk about those things all right all right, we're going to wrap up with prayer, and I'm going to just see real quick here. Hold on one second. Um, if Suzette, you're still on here. I was going to ask you to do this on, the, I think it was like the first session, and you jumped off literally as soon as I was about to call your name. But if you wouldn't mind, would you mind uh, unmuting yourself and just praying us out tonight? Uh, we're going to end in prayer. I love you all so, so much. So that if you're willing, let me know. If you can't, let me know that as well. I'll give her a second. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Praise the Lord. This is Suzette Gordon. If you could just pray us out tonight uh, and ask the Lord to continue to build us in faith towards God. Yes, Lord, we thank you for this word tonight. And we just thank you, Lord, for the privilege of just coming into your presence. We just thank you, Lord, for um, what's being deposited in us. And Lord, we just thank you that um, our foundation is built upon the faith and word of God. And your word is strong and stable. It is our rock. And we yield to you, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, that we are going from faith to faith and glory to glory. We thank you, Lord, that without faith, it is impossible to please you. And we want to please you. So we just ask you, Lord, to um, increase our faith, increase the um, discernment and knowledge and understanding and take us Lord where we need to go Lord open up our understanding our discernment and um, help us to see what we haven't been able to see and to hear what we haven't been able to hear and we yield ourselves to you and we just thank you and I bless each one on this zoom call in Jesus name amen and amen well praise the Lord thank you so much uh Suzette love all of you thank you for joining tonight yes so Brie um I don't, I don't know if you can go back and check that out, but go back and check that out if you can when I did that. And if you want me to explain it more, I will. So just let me know. But love you all. Please remember what I asked at the beginning of class tonight. Those of you that can want to go back into the Facebook group, encourage everyone that registered for this class. We have almost 200 people that registered uh, for this class, and we're only on session three. So we don't want people to get discouraged or to uh, let things fall off. But go into the group if you can make a post, even if you want to make a public post, you can encourage people to, to lock in and to let's end well. We have a, a few more sessions uh, before we wrap up our foundations class. I'm excited to go through all of that with you. Again, all of you have gotten emails. If you're not getting my emails, let me know. You can email me carlwright61 at gmail.com and let me know that you're not getting those. But all of the links are in that email. There's a link for those of you that don't use Facebook, uh, there is a link to a YouTube playlist where all of these recordings will be, uh, as well as the recordings that are in the Facebook group. You can look at them there. Uh, and if there's anything, I'm going to send you the notes from tonight's class, as well as the book should be ready very, very soon. By the end of the month, they should be ready to ship out. So look forward to getting those to you. All right. Marcelli just asked. Yes. Yeah, so by the end of this month, the, the book should be printed and in your mailboxes. All right. So love you guys. Be blessed. See you next Monday.